who Steve Harvey is. And, you know, he's the host of it, and he's the big guy, the funny guy. But when those kids get up, like this Ian or Ethan, four years old, and he starts playing, he starts doing his thing, the headliner isn't Steve Harvey. The headliner is that little kid. He becomes the spotlight, absolutely. The same is the story of Jonah. We've been taking a little detour from the book of John and, and focusing on our book of Jonah. And the same thing we just saw happen here is what happens in the book of Jonah. We think it's a story about Jonah the prophet. We think it's a story about a big fish. But really, it's a story about God. God is the headliner. God is the real star in the story of Jonah. In Jonah, we'll find that the character of Jonah, he's actually quite a passive prophet. He's a passive in a very passive role. When God calls, he doesn't want to obey. He wants to stay where it's nice and comfortable and not move an inch. He doesn't want to follow God's lead. Only active thing that he does is in saying no, pretty much, to God repeatedly. I don't want to do what you asked me to do. Even his name is passive. Jonah means dove. Now, other prophets like Isaiah, they got the big strong names like God has saved. That's what Isaiah means. Jonah got dove. He's the dove prophet. Throughout the book, we see that Jonah flees, but God is the one that pursues. We see that Jonah falls, but God is the one that lifts him up. God, throughout the book, is the star. He's the active one in the book of Jonah. He sends Jonah a message. He creates a storm when Jonah gets off track. He commissions a whale to save. He sends Jonah then in person again to show mercy, to initiate with a people who don't want anything to do with him. And he pursues with forgiveness and he shows his ways over and over in his salvation that he continually gives out to the people. The star is definitely God through the book. What we find is in the book of Jonah, his character and his heart and his mission are revealed through this story. In chapter 1, we see that God is all-powerful, God is sovereign. In chapter 2, we see God is our deliverer. In chapter 3, God is forgiving and merciful. And in chapter 4, God is the compassionate God. And we'll see that as we go through. Jonah, not the big fish, not Jonah, but God. Story reveals God. And when I'm studying this, especially this week, I'm thinking that's how our lives should go as well. That we are not the ones who should have the lead role, not the spotlight, not stealing the show, but it's God in our lives who wants to be revealed. The reality is that for us to have peace in our lives, for us to have genuine peace in our lives, we have to come to the place where we realize that our life is not ultimately about us, but it's about God. Our life is not ultimately for us, but for God. His spirit, his purpose, his will, he's the one that needs to be center stage. And when we realize this, when we realize our life is about God and what he wants, then that hopefully will help us to let go of our control and yield to his, even in those times of interruptions. We talked about last week, those places where he interrupts our life. Our life plan is going one way, and he takes us, he derails us, he interrupts us, and we find that those are really invitations to a more purposeful, deeper life. There's an equation. We have paper and pens. I forgot to mention, uh, Raleigh, if you don't mind handing those out. We took notes last Sabbath. Um, you can actually, by the end of this Jonah time, you can have a stapled version of a journal if you take notes during our sermon time. But what writing down helps along the way is it helps kind of your reflection. It's not just up here. You don't get sidetracked. You can actually focus on some of the questions we're going to go through for your own life. And what are we here for but to figure out what God is wanting to speak to us in our life uh, here and now and as we go out on mission with him. So as we're um, going through this, I'm going to be asking a couple questions, and they're not just rhetorical questions, they're questions for you to process and reflect, and if you can write down on paper, all the better for your heart and soul and mind. One of the things I want you to write down, we talked about this last week, but I don't think I had you actually write down this equation. 
you write on your paper, divine interruption, divine interruption, plus... your submission or yielding or saying yes, however that fits best for you. So divine interruption plus your submission equals eternal purpose, significance, eternally impacting purpose and significance. And today we're going to find out that that equals salvation. Not just big eternal salvation, but in the moment now in your life, salvation. So God's interruption plus your yielding to saying, okay, yes, if you want to take me on a detour, if you want to derail me from my plan, if you want to interrupt, I'm going to take that as an invitation that what you're going to bring out of that is going to be purpose significance, and my salvation in the here and now. We're going to walk that through. So keep that at the head of your paper there. Most or half of the book of Jonah is about Jonah grappling with the concept of God being first in his life. It's him wrestling against it. It's grasping him, grasping to keep control, to keep his title role in the story. He had been given, of course, the gift of prophecy, and he was very glad, very happy to serve God with that gift. He wanted to, to be used by God to help make a difference in, in the people of his world there. He was happy to use the gift that God had given him as long as he was serving in the part of the world that Jonah wanted to serve. And as long as he was able to serve a particular group of people that he wanted to make a difference with. So Jonah's motto might well have been, I want to serve God as long as it's convenient. I desire to do his will until it gets a tad uncomfortable. I want to hear from God. I want to hear his word. As long as the message is one that I'm supposed to be passing on to someone else. This is Jonah. And this may very well be you and I. With this spirit, it's, it makes sense then. With this kind of view and what we see in the story, it makes sense that Jonah would keep trying to take control and take ownership of what he'd only been asked to manage. He'd been given a gift of prophecy. He decided, I'm going to own that gift instead of manage that gift. It's like a story I read recently, a true story, about this lady who comes out of her... Uh, store. She's been shopping. She returns to her car to find four men inside of it. She drops her shopping bag. She draws a handgun from her purse and she points it at him and with a very forceful voice tells him, I have a gun and I know how to use it. Get out of the car. And these four guys, they didn't, they didn't wait for a second invitation. They got out of the car and they took off. They ran. She was quite rattled, a bit shaken. She put her bags in the car, got in, got her keys, and she couldn't get it in the ignition. She, was just, she couldn't get it. It wouldn't work, and it wasn't working, and it wasn't working. And she realized, like I did a couple weeks ago, her car was four cars over, and she just kicked four men out of their car. So she gets out. She looks around, makes sure there's, like, where are they? And she goes over, gets into her car. She drives herself straight to the police department, turns herself in for having pulled a gun on four men, and the sergeant, the dust sergeant, starts cracking up. And he's like, take a look at the other end of the counter. And there's the four men reporting uh, a carjacking by this little lady with, you know, white hair and a gun and no file. No charges were filed in that, in that situation. But this is the lady gets into trouble because she tries to control. She tries to take ownership of something that wasn't hers to control her own. And that's what we do in our lives. That's when we get into trouble when we try to take control of something in our lives, we try to own something in our lives that's not meant for us to control our own. I want you to take a moment on your piece of paper. And I want you to list out the things that God has given to you, the blessings that God has given to you. Like Jonah, what roles in life has God given you? 
what gifts or skills. I'm just going to throw out a couple things here for you to jog your, your, get your brain going. What gifts has God given you? Talents, tangible blessings, your house, possessions, money. What has God gifted you in your life with? Relationships, intelligence. Are you wiser than some? Are you not so wise? I don't know if that's a gift. Flexibility in your schedule, good health, creative ideas. Do you have unique kind of goals, aspirations, dreams? Do you have experience? Are you an expertise? Do you have expertise in some area? What are some of the blessings that God has gifted you with, has given to you in your life? This is so great. This is why we have praise and worship. We could go on and on our list. You're keeping on writing. There's so many things God gives us and fills us up in our lives with. But you can continue writing that throughout the day, throughout the week. But here's the question, looking over your list, those things that you're really happy God's given you, those gifts, those blessings. Here's the hard question. Have you taken ownership of any of these areas of your life that you should only be managing for the king, for our God? Have you taken control of or trying to take control of or owning, owning what you're only supposed to be managing for God? I was asking myself that question, and in my studies, I'm saying, well, how, how would I know? How, how do I know? I mean, because I, I sincerely seek God's will, as, as do you. I sincerely, we, we want to know what God wants us to do. We want to move forward in the way that he's telling us to do, whether in our job, our relationship, or in our ministry, and whatever plan or project or pursuit that we're on in life. We want to do what God wants us to do. We don't want to take ownership. So how do we know if we've taken over ownership or we're trying to control versus just manage? How do we know when we've moved from operating in a sphere we're not supposed to be operating in? Well, I want to ask you, and this is what kind of jarred me, is what is it like? Have you ever tried to do something you weren't supposed to do, you weren't meant to do, because you didn't have the skill or the ability or the authority to do it? Have you ever tried to attempt something, you've tried to do it, and it typically doesn't work so well when you aren't meant to be the one doing it. You don't have the skill, you don't have the ability, you don't have the authority to do it. Now, I was thinking about this and, and thinking of childhood. Now, perhaps I'm sure there's plenty of adult scenarios we can all think of where we've attempted to do something and it didn't go so well because we weren't meant to do it. Um, but, you know, it eases the pain of our pride a little bit if we look at childhood. It eases it even more if we can look at someone else other than yourself. So I'm going to look at my brother. He was like a walking, he's not here to defend himself. He's up in Ohio and he doesn't listen to my sermons. So he can't, he can't get upset about that. He's a walking symbol in a good way, a walking symbol of what happens when you go from managing what's yours to manage to taking control or taking ownership of what is not yours to tackle. So let me tell you some stories of when he was five or six. We were living in California, and this is just an example we can relate to in our own lives. In California, my brother and I are in the garage. He's, like I said, around five, about, yeah, five, five or six and way up high on top shelf, my dad, my dad was a coroner, so, you know, dead things was his thing. Um, we had tarantulas in California. We would help them crawl up the wall because they were so cute and fuzzy. And then when we would, they would die, we would put them in, more, my father would put them in formaldehyde to keep them so we could study them later. And so he had a jar up high on the high shelf, a jar of tarantulas in formaldehyde. And my brother and I wanted to look at them a little closer. So instead of asking the owner, i.e. my dad, to do what he does best to get that jar, my brother decides to become that person, and he scales the shelves to get the jar on top, and he got it. 
crashing down on him, crashing down onto the, the floor, shattered, formaldehyde, dead spiders everywhere. That's what we got from him taking ownership instead of managing. When he's five, he was also wanting to be like the teenager that was living with us at the time. His name was Mark, tall, strong teenager that would do chin-ups and pull-ups in the garage off of these pipes. And so my brother, five years old, wanted to do it too. So he had the guy lift him up to the, the pole, the, 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 what do you call it, bar up there. And uh, he thought he could manage something that wasn't yet his to manage with his wee little muscles. And so he's up there trying to do a chin-up or a pull-up or whatever it is, and he slips, he falls, crashes to the cement floor, and now he has a scar to show for that attempt. And one more, he was six years old, different house. He was supposed to be managing putting the dishes away. And he had a casserole dish, a glass casserole dish. He was supposed to put it up way up high. Well, he wasn't supposed to do it. He was supposed to get my mom or dad to help him. The owners were supposed to help him put it up, but he decided to take matters into his own hands. Again, he scales the cabinets to put it up. He slips, it slips, it breaks. He slices his hand almost to the tendon, and he has another scar to show for it. Most of my brother's scars are symbols of when he tried to take a roll or a task, or attempt something he wasn't meant to do. And instead of forward movement, he got frustration and he got pain. And there was certainly a lack of peace until things could heal a bit. The scars were a reminder to him of his need to wait on the owner rather than take matters into his own hands. I'm sure each and every one of us probably has scars in our lives where we have attempted to take things into our own hands rather than waiting on our God, waiting on timing, waiting on the situation to be formed and shaped by our owner God. I think that having, how do you determine if you are taking control or ownership where you should only be managing? I think the greatest barometer is that peace barometer inside of ourselves. Is there peace with what we're doing or is there not peace? It helps us determine if we're stepping out of the role that we are given. I know for me, whenever I move out of following God's lead to trying to call the own sh my own shots in my life or trying to make something or anything happen, that I lack all sorts of peace when that happens. Instead of success and forward movement, I net spinning wheels and frustration over and over because things aren't going the direction I want them to go, because things aren't going in the timing I want them to go or the way I want it to happen. And it's not until I finally pause and consider God that I actually can hear his voice. His, through his word, through his spirit, through the chaos in my head, he gets through and it's usually questioning, did I ask you to do that, Denise? Did I ask you? And the answer is, well, no. Okay, is that your responsibility to figure that out or is it mine? Well, it's yours. And so God is throughout scripture over and over, let me handle this for your life. Let me figure this out. You do what I ask. You step when I tell you, don't go out in front of me, but follow my lead. And if you're not hearing anything, then what are we asked to do? Wait on God. Be still and know that I am God. Keep doing what you're doing until I give you more. I think when we do this, when we remember, we stop in our attempts on those interruption times, on those detour times, and we're trying to force our way back to our plan, when we can stop and remember who God is, our, the owner, versus who we are, the manager, the child, then we can remember then we need to trust him, depend on him, and we can let go. And in that letting go is when that peace gets restored in us because it's not our responsibility. When we're in those interrupted places in our lives, it is God's responsibility to get us to the purposes and align us with his plans, when and how. Whether it's an idea that you're needing or it's a job you're needing, a motivation you're needing or resources or wisdom or a relationship, a person, 
whatever it is, Galatians 5 has all the gifts of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, patience, self-control. What is it that you're feeling you need? These are gifts from the Spirit. We cannot make things happen. God has a plan and a purpose, and those things come from the owner. Give it in his time and his place, when and how, for us to use, to manage, to work with as he leads us. Psalms 89, 11 says it out, says the world and everything in it belongs to God, including your relationships, including your successes and your effectiveness, including the best plan for your life. Everything, everything belongs to God. I think Paul tries to help us understand this concept of ownership versus manage by, management by looking at the principles of God's purpose for us. And I, I want to read Ephesians 2, 7 through 10. It's a familiar passage, but it might not sound so familiar because I'm going to read it in the Message Bible translation. I want you to listen, though, for who is active in these verses. Ephesians 2, 7 through 10. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next, to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus, saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we had done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. Now, you will probably recognize Ephesians 2, verse 10 in the NIV translation, for we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Scripture is very clear. God has plans for us. He has purpose intended in our lives to fulfill, which means that then our greatest fulfillment in life happens when we let God take the lead, when he moves us, when he says, go here, go there, don't move, when we go with him, when we allow him to interrupt us, when we allow him to realign us to be his people in the places he wants us to be, that is when we'll be doing the best and experiencing the best of the good work he has prepared in advance for us to do. Believing that God has a plan and a purpose for us, believing that we can trust and depend on him, is so much easier when things are going our way, isn't it? When things are going and they're lining up with what we have in our own minds and our own lives and our own heads of how we want to how we want to run our world. It gets challenging when he interrupts our plans and allows or orchestrates in a completely different direction like he did for Jonah. It's challenging because when interruption occurs, it's not going our way. It's usually because we're, A, not seeing the results that we expect to see. Like success means this, then I should be able to see these results externally, visually, it's not going the way we want, or things aren't happening in the time we want them to happen. And we start to disbelieve that God's really watching out for us because it's not happening and I obviously need this now. I need something happening now. So timing. And the third one is when his calling or his new directions or his interruptions just don't make sense to us, just do not make sense to us at all. I think number three is where Jonah got derailed in, from his following God because God's instructions to him didn't make sense. We talked about this last week, uh, his purpose. It did make sense because um, a prophet's purpose, and especially Jonah's purpose as a prophet, was to help Israel prosper become safe, get those boundaries up. He's the one that guided them to do that from the word of God. Now God was asking him to help their enemies prosper. That doesn't make sense to Jonah. Two, 
he would be moving like some 600 miles from his hometown. And the scholars, biblical scholars, look at that and say the likelihood that he would ever return home would be slim to none. It was such a feat at that time to travel such a distance. That doesn't make sense to Jonah, who's lived all his life and with his, his nation, his, his religion, his customs, his culture, his family. But the third one is the most fascinating one and the most telling I think one Jonah no doubt struggled with the most. Israel as a nation had been called to be separate from all other people. He as a prophet was to speak to God's chosen ones, to give messages of hope and direction to, to those set apart people, the consecrated treasures of God. He was called to help Israel do what Israel had been called to do, to be the separate chosen ones. Jonah was like, I was not called, we as a people were not called to help, to go talk with, or to live among the not chosen. I was not called, we were not called to go and help and live among and speak to the anti-treasured ones, the Gentile, the unclean people. And yet this is exactly what God called him to do, to do something that did not make sense to Jonah. God would want him to continue doing what Israel needed. Surely what Jonah had the skill to do, what he had the experience doing, surely this is what God would want him to do to help Israel be successful. But when it doesn't make sense, it's hard to believe that God is in it. What doesn't make sense right now in your life? What is God asking in your life right now that doesn't make sense? What is God stirring in you or nudging in you or towards you today that doesn't quite look right in your mind? It's not adding up according to what your plan is in your own head. It doesn't make sense. When something isn't adding up, when it's not making sense to us that God is nudging us, there's, there's caution, same as Jonah. When there's something from Scripture that is clear or God's Spirit in us, it doesn't go along with our logic. It doesn't go along with our, our logical or well-thought-out plans or direction. It doesn't align with the tried-and-true methods. It doesn't look like what everybody else is doing or tends to live their life, when it's separate from that, different from that, it's, it's a break from that, we tend to discount it then, and we feel justified in our own running away attempts, whether it's ignoring what we've read or being distracted or not following or doing our own thing, something that makes more sense to us, that we have more control over. Jeremiah 17, 9 speaks to us, though, it reminds us that the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. It's quite a sentence. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Proverbs 28, 26 tells us those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom with a capital W, wisdom, are kept safe. Now, obviously, this is not a blanket. Don't trust your gut. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your feelings. But the caution is, is that we cannot let our heart or our feelings or our inability to understand what God is doing, we cannot let these things be the factor for choosing whether or not we yield to God, whether or not we submit to his direction, whether or not we give control to him when he takes us on a detour. We cannot let our feelings or our heart or the things that don't make sense to us stop us from saying yes to God anyway. The Old and New Testament tells us that God's ways are overwhelmingly beyond anything we can imagine or grasp. And it's why we have encouragement from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him. Listen to him. Seek him and he will make your path straight. I believe God desires for each of us to grow in our trust and our leaning. 
He knows that when we're in intense situations, when we get interrupted from our plans, when we get moved off of our comfortable paths, these are the times in our lives where our true heart, our natural tendencies will most clearly be seen. What will we default to? What will we default to? What's our default mechanism? Is it automatically when hard time hits, when we get detoured or derailed or interrupted, do we trust God or do we trust ourselves? Do we seek after him or do we seek our own solutions first? Do we depend on him or depend on our own abilities? I think what God might do in our lives by allowing, by bringing interruptions is providing opportunities for us to flex and grow those trusting muscles. So our default becomes more and more looking to God, anticipating he's got a purpose he's going to bring forward through this versus being anxious about what we don't understand, saying okay and yes and yielding to God versus resisting. It's interesting as Jonah was in that growing moment. This book of Jonah was about his growing moments of trusting. He resisted and he ran because he didn't understand. God's request didn't make sense. But his request of Jonah was exactly what God needed to have happen to best reveal who he was to the expanding world. God needed Jonah to do what didn't make sense to Jonah. He needed him to do that so God's heart and character and mission could be revealed. The book of Jonah was written about the 4th to 5th, 5th to 4th century BC, and it was intended to be read to Israel, to the nation of Israel. This was after Israel had been exiled, post-exile, and this book was written to be read aloud to the Israelites to remind them, to remind them of God's purpose and plan and mission. Most of the prophets' books that are written has the prophetic words that were spoken by the prophets. That's what you read in in these prophet books in the Old Testament, all the words that they spoke of prophecy. But in the book of Jonah, it's a narrative. It's a story. There are characters that are being revealed. It's just a mere glance at his prophetic words to the Ninevites. But the main thrust is the characters that are progressively being moved and revealed, God's character and mission most of all. And when we get to chapter 3... When we get to chapter 3 is when we see God's full revelation. We see God's relenting heart. We see his mercy and his love for those who turn to him. We see God's desire to save. God reminds the Israelites by the reading of this book, by this story, he reminds the Israelites who were called to represent him to the world. He reminds that his ultimate mission is to reach all people. Not just the Israelites, not just his chosen people, but all people, even those outside the Hebrew nation. His love, his mercy extends to those outside of the circle of God's family, that his family would now include the enemy. His family would now include the outsider, the Moabite, the Gentile, the non-Jew, the Samaritan. If you guys have had a chance to read, Reggie wrote an article for Grace Notes about this very thing, lining out that throughout Scripture, throughout Scripture, God shows us again and again, He is for the outsiders to bring in, to be inclusive of all, and to save all. Jonah was a precursor to Jesus, which Jesus makes clear in the book of Matthew and Luke. And in his story, there's a peek ahead at what Christ would fulfill and make clear, that salvation was for all, no matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter your past, your present, or your future. If you desire to know God, you will know life, the eternal kind, the quality of eternity now. So God's interruption to Jonah as his interruption in our own lives has a purpose beyond what we can see that may not make sense to us, but will more clearly reveal God's heart and purpose to love and to save. And we will see that as we let him lead. God, as we see, saved Jonah from the sea when he was thrown overboard, saved him from the sea, he saved him from the big fish, and he ultimately saved him from himself. It's interesting to note that when Jonah was at his lowest point, 
the detour, the interruption had taken him so far, he was facing the worst situation possible in the belly of a fish, guts, entrails, and all. When God's interruption led him to descend into this darkest place, this is when salvation came. This is when his salvation came to be. This is when he was brought to the place where he could reflect and he could realize. And we see in the book of Jonah where he stops and he gets a new perspective then on God's call in his life. And he starts to realize that he wants to say yes and yield to God. And that's when redemption and returning to God's bigger plan and purpose takes place. At the lowest point is when he was on the brink of salvation. Where is your worst place right now in your life? What is the belly of the fish for you in your life right now? Where in your life is it dark? Does it smell really bad in some place you thought you would never find yourself? Perhaps, like the book of Jonah, perhaps it is your brink of salvation. Perhaps it is your opportunity to reflect to have realization that redemption is coming for yielding to God to return ready for God's bigger work and purpose that he has waiting for you when you're ready to say yes. The question is, what are you and I doing in these places? What are we doing when we have been interrupted and all that we see around us is darkness in the belly of a fish in our situation Do we pursue distractions that keep us from thinking about the yuck that we're in, or do we pursue God? Do we pursue him to listen, to hear, to reflect, to thank, and to be ready to move when he moves us on? Following God, yielding to him, saying yes is rarely comfortable and it's rarely convenient in our lives. Jesus made it clear to his disciples, the fox have dens, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to even lay his head. And then he says, come follow me, because that's the kind of life, because it's not about your control. You manage and do what I give you. Let me be the one in control. Jesus' promises in Luke 11, 28, is that we will be blessed. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed are you when he interrupts your plans, when he nudges and he stirs you outside of your comfort zone. Blessed are you when you take time to pause and reflect, to hear God through his word, through his spirit. Blessed are you that whatever he says, whatever he asks you to do, you obey. You will be blessed is the promise in the Bible. As we see in Jonah's story, when God is allowed to be first place in the story of our lives, even in our interruptions, when we yield to him, he will be revealed. And the blessing that will be revealed is that he's a God who saves us now and for eternity. He saves us for his purpose. He saves us to help him kingdom build. He saves us to knowing who God is personally, and he saves us to experience the eternal quality kind of life here and now and for all of time. And when we say yes to God, he will help us become and expand that yes so others can know him as well around us. That's my prayer that as we continue in this interruption, as we continue in this book of Jonah, that whatever God has in your life, in my life, that he's interrupting us, that he's derailing us, he's detouring us, that we will see, as Jonah did, that by giving God complete control, letting go and letting to him what he will and how he will, that we'll find that blessing in our own life and that peace that we all seek. Bow your heads with me as we pray. God, thank you again for putting stories in the Bible that we can relate to. They were written centuries ago. They were experienced even further back than that. And yet so relevant for us to hear you, to see you, to have you remind us that you are God and we are not, that you are in control and you will give us the directions that we need when we need them. And we just need to stay in tune with you. 
don't move us out of the belly of the well, God. Don't move us from these situations until we have grasped a hold of our role and yours. And we can say yes to you no matter what you ask, that we will hear you and obey and be blessed because of it. We thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.